several years ago, Mohammed Mohammedan, with a great Indian leader, received a group of Christian ministers from Baptists that separated their men. After their breakfast of goat's milk and mixed sweet wine leaves had boiled, they went up to the roof to have their personal conference with the famous little man, dressed in a loincloth and a one dollar Ingersoll watch in his pocket. The discussion revolved around Christian conversion. Mr. Gandhi said, I believe in Christian conversion if it is genuine. On the other hand, there is nothing worse than being something on the outside that you are not on the inside. Mr. Gandhi went on to say, if a man really has found God through discovering Jesus Christ, then he must be baptized and show the world that he is a follower of Jesus, else he will be a living liar. A book has recently been published in England entitled The Battle for the Mind. It has aroused a storm in scientific and theological circles. The author is Dr. William Sargent, a well-known practicing psychiatrist. The author's chief interest is in the use which can be made for good or bad of the mechanisms of the human mind. He is concerned with the ways in which political, social, or religious conversion can be induced by psychological techniques. Many young Christians have already been disturbed by this book. Dr. Sargent has described the physiology of Christian conversion based upon Pavlov's almost inhuman experiments with dogs. He indicates that conversions are simply the outcome of conditioned reflexes, and he indicates that there is a parallel between the conditions wrested by brainwashing in communistic countries and that of Christian conversion. He links the preaching of John Wesley and the practices of being on drugs, chanting, dancing, shaking, and handling poisonous snakes. To say that this book is blasphemous is putting it mildly. Dr. Sargent indicates that Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus was nothing but hysterical manifestations and hallucinations. In describing the glorious day of Pentecost, Dr. Sargent says concerning Peter's preaching, then he froze an emotional thunderbolt and he stared at excited listeners. He accuses Peter of using shock tactics in preaching on the day of Pentecost. Throughout the scientific, theological, psychological, and intellectual world, there's an increasing discussion of the subject of conversion and evangelism. I've heard psychiatrists recently said that the church does not get back to converting the people we psychiatrists are going to have to do. Another famous psychiatrist has said, man is so psychologically constituted that he needs conversion. This word conversion is being used almost everywhere. Advertisers use it trying to convert people from one product to another. Finance uses it in describing the exchanging of one type of security for another. Foresters uses it in describing the changing of one type of forest to another. The military is using it in describing the conversion from standard weapons to nuclear weapons. Sales conversion is used constantly in almost every realm, so it is also used in the spiritual realm. Webster gives this definition, from one position or direction to another, passing from one side to another. Winthrop Huckleby, one of the most brilliant women of letters of this generation, was an Oxford girl, but she was a humanist. One of her college friends had been converted to Christ and had now decided to go out as a missionary. A dedication service was to be held and Miss Huckleby was invited. After attending the dedication service, she wrote a letter to her friends afterwards. And she said this, It must be wonderful to make up your mind when you're 18 to give your life to one cause. The difficulty with me is to walk from one dedicate himself. I'm blown about by a wandering wind of great care and sorrow and desire. Why my weakness and self-indulgence and timidity keeps me tied to earth. I sometimes wistfully wish that I could be converted to. Today, I want us to turn to the scriptures and see what the Bible has to say about conversion. The verb convert, or some part of it, occurs 14 times in the New Testament. It simply means stopping and turning. The idea of turning in this word is basic. Sometimes the individual turns himself, and sometimes 
He says, Stand up. This word is the subject of the message that Peter on the day of Pentecost, when he warned the people, Repent ye therefore, and be converted. Conversion then is that voluntary change in the mind of a sinner in which he turns on the one hand from sin and on the other hand to Christ. Conversion is the human side of the tremendous transformation that takes place, which as viewed from the divine side we call the new birth or regeneration. It is simply man turning from sin to Christ. While the scripture teaches that God turns men to himself, men are also exhorted to turn themselves to God. While God is represented as the author of the new heart and the new spirit, men are commanded to make for themselves a new heart and a new spirit. It is the old problem of grace and free will. No one can be converted except by the grace of God, for we are too weak to turn ourselves, are needed. And we turn only in response to some stimulus provided outside ourselves, which of course in this case is the Holy Spirit. But no one can be converted except with the consent of his own free will, because God does not override human choice. We may not be free to choose, because sin weakens our power of moral choice, but we are free to refuse. We can refuse to be chosen. Simon Peter could not become a disciple until Jesus called him and said, follow me. But others also heard the same call and refused it or put it off. One said, Lord, let me go and bury my father. Another said, let me first say farewell to those of my home. These men refused Christ's call. This combination of divine calling and human responsibility with a yes or a no runs throughout the Bible and characterizes all God's dealings with men. The Bible confronts us with man's moral independence within himself and his spiritual dependence upon God. In the picturesque words of Psalm 1829, the psalmist said, With the help of my God, I shall leap over the wall. Now, no one can leap over walls except by his own will and effort. But some walls are so high that they need more than this. The psalmist knew such walls. They could be leaped only with the help of his God. God does not lift him over. God helps him when he leaps. Man does the leaping. God does the helping. It is like this with the conversion. There is resolve, a sheer act of will within the sphere of an individual's power of choosing and deciding, but this resolve is also a response to a stimulus from outside himself, which he did not prompt or cause or perhaps expect. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in conviction and the preparation of the heart for the preaching of the seed of the gospel. The Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But grace is God's, the faith is ours. But the free will with which we choose is God's gift, and the capacity to believe and trust is God's gift also. Therefore, within every conversion, there is the working of the divine and the human, but their relation to each other remains a mystery. It has been my privilege to see thousands converted to Christ, and I still do not understand the mystery of God's grace and man's faith, but I know that both are involved. On the one hand, Jesus said, He who comes to me, I will not cast out. And on the other hand, he said, No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Ladies and gentlemen, I am convinced that the Bible teaches the necessity of conversion. I am absolutely certain of my own conversion. I am equally convinced of the genuineness of the conversion of thousands of people in all parts of the world. The great St. Augustine described his own conversion in a famous passage in which he said, quote, I continued my miserable complaining. How long, how long shall I go on saying tomorrow and again tomorrow? Why not now? 
Grand afternoon that my uncleanness was burned out. Such things I said weeping in the most bitter sorrow of my heart. And suddenly I heard a voice from some nearby house. A boy's voice or a girl's voice. I do not know. But it was a sort of singing song repeated again and again. Take and read. Take and read. Take and read. I arose. In taking the incident as quite certainly a divine command to open my book of scripture and read the passage in it which I should open. I snatched it up and opened it and in silence read the passage on which my eyes fell, not in wrath and in drunkenness, not in trembling and in purities, not in contemptual envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus and make not provision for the flesh. I had no wish to leave heaven and no need, for in that instant with the very ending of the sentence it was as though a light of utter confidence shone in on all my heart and all the darkness of uncertainty vanished away. In that hour I was converted, said Augustine, end quote. Before this moment, Augustine was one of the wickedest of men. In no sense could he be called Christian. He was cultured and civilized, but he was still a pagan. As a result of this one experience, he became one of the greatest Christian theologians of all time. John Wesley describes his experience. He was born into a Christian home, the son of the rector of Epworth. Devoutly religious at Oxford, the founder of the Holy Club, given to prayer, good works, always eager to lead others to Christ from his earliest days. He went to Georgia as a missionary in 1735. From all outward appearances, he seemed to be a Christian. But in spite of all these good works, he had never been truly converted to Jesus Christ until May 24, 1738, when he had an experience similar to that of Paul on the Damascus Road. And there, St. Augustine, he writes in his journal, quote, In the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, when he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. End quote. In reading the rest of Wesley's journal, I noted that he always looked back to that moment as the hour of his conversion. Both of these conversions were sudden, though in both cases there had been a considerable period of restlessness beforehand. A sudden conversion does not preclude a good many preparatory incidents one way or another. Both were prompted by hearing the voice of the living God through a passage of Scripture. The Word of God had touched them. In both cases, the experience produced an immediate change in life and attitude and a sense of release from sin and guilt. I ask you today, have you been converted? Has there been a moment in your life when your heart has been strangely warm, when the light of confidence has dawned upon your own soul? Ladies and gentlemen, I am convinced that this is the great need of the world today, the conversion of men and women to Jesus Christ. In God's balances, one soul weighs more than the entire world of material things. New Testament conversion applies God's remedy to the need of the world. Our world is sick unto death. Our culture is in cloudy confusion, and our civilization is in peril. The good news of the gospel of Christ offers the only satisfying remedy. There is nothing else, nothing better, and nothing beyond. The evangel of the redeeming Christ is the ultimate. We cannot include it from this gospel that can transform the lives of individuals. The good news of the gospel solves the problem of human destiny, the most fundamental problem of human existence. It solves the anthropological problem. It solves the philosophical problem of where we come from, why we're here, and where we're going. There are thousands of people listening to me now who are frustrated, confused, and empty. There's a sense of guilt and sin upon your soul. Yet somehow you are inadequate to solve the innermost problems of your own soul, heart, and mind. You are searching for an answer. I tell you, the answer is simply this. First, you must recognize that you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Secondly, you must recognize that Christ died and rose again for our sins. His death was not an accident. It was in the plan of God that he should pour out his blood on the cross for our sins. 
We do not like to come to the place where blood is shed. For some people it is their culture. That is one reason why we have a cross. For some, it's how their culture signals in the sight of the holy God. Yet the cross is their culture to us. How much more it is their culture to God, as indicated when Christ prayed on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment, he had battled with sin, hell, and the grave. But thank God, the resurrection attested that he had conquered the cross and the grave triumphant. Christ was alive, able to save for the lovers, those that put their trust in him. Thirdly, God requires that we receive his Son by faith. For as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The moment you receive Christ by repentance and faith, then regeneration takes place, and you become a new creation in Christ. The scripture teaches that old things will pass away, and all things will become new. Dr. Matthew Cutane, the great scientist, once said, I am a Christian by the laboratory method of experimentation. I ask you today, have you experimented Christ? You have heard about Christ, but have you ever truly received him? Are you a Christian by the laboratory method? I ask you to repent of your sins and be converted to them. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that thou would show to us the necessity of being converted to Jesus Christ. May we know this. May it become a reality in our lives. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord. Amen. Now you'll hear propaganda machine is going full blast against the United States for resuming nuclear tests. They are warning that the world stands on the brink of war. But this is just out of one side of their mouth. From the other side, they're talking peace in Berlin. Thus, we have the great paradox of communism. There can be no question but that the world today continues in the grip of a great crisis, which poses an unprecedented threat to humanity and to human institutions. We are living in an age which is marked by mighty political convulsions, treacherous revolutions, economic and racial unrest, bitter enmity against established order, and periodic wars. To a threat to our freedom and our Christian way of life is by far the greatest that has ever been faced in history. A European leader said this past week that men of all nations look into the future with undisguised alarm. The New York Times said some time ago, quote, We stand at one of the most decisive moments in history when we begin to see what the late H.G. Wells called the shape of things to come. The clouds thin, the mist rises, and we see heaven or hell, end quote. Never in history, not even in 1949 or 1939, have the peoples of all nations been gripped by such deadly fear. The whole world knows that if the great powers start fighting again, it will be a fight to the finish with both sides using the nuclear weapons which are being tested and perfected. The United States was reluctantly driven to this test series by the Soviet Union's disregard for international agreement when they made their recent tests. Editors seem to be hunting for words to describe what is going on this weekend. Perhaps the right ones were written long ago when Jesus talked to his disciples about his return, telling them how they might know when it was near at hand. He said, There shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and upon the earth. There will be distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. No words ever spoken or written describe more accurately the present situation than do these words of Christ. He pictured a world in torment, just as we see it today. And all these signs, said Jesus, are signs of the times announcing the approach of climactic events which will bring about the end of the world of evil as we know it today. They are signs of his coming in glory, heralds of the dawn of that glad day when war shall be no more and peace shall reign from sea to sea. This glorious news assures us that God is still in control of world affairs 
and the big hand is still on the helm of the ship. Strike and turn around. Lord, go works and works, said Jesus. Lord, the world may break out again. Multitudes may become panic stricken as they watch the unfolding tragedy. But such conditions will not continue forever, the Bible says. When these things begin to take place, said Jesus, we're to look up and lift up our heads, knowing that our divine deliverance is at hand. So amidst the fearful distress and perplexity of our time, sensing the anguish of a world in torment, we may calm our own hearts with the blessed hope of Christ's coming. The heart of the Christian today need not falter inasmuch as we have a divinely given perspective in relation to the fearful events which are transpiring on this earth. From a biblical point of view, the history of the world centers around the person and work of Jesus Christ. The God who created this universe is sovereign over all. In his all-wise providence, he has defined the ages, and his plans and purposes are all centered in his blessed Son. The second psalm is a remarkable portrayal of the Son of God in relation to human history, and to this extent it is a miniature divine account of human affairs and human history. This psalm speaks of an impending crisis and a world rebellion against God at some future date. The psalm opens with a question, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? In other words, the psalmist is asking the same questions which millions ask throughout the world today. What is the explanation for the distress, the tragedy, the lawlessness, and the troubles of the world today? The scripture provides an answer to this question. The deceitfulness and the desperate wickedness of the human heart influenced by Satan account for the raging of the nations. Satan is behind the scenes of the present era, calling the moves that are taking place within this world system, which is largely under his control. The world is witnessing a struggle for the minds of men. Satan is waging total war in an effort to capture minds, especially of the intellectual, and to energize them in the direction of his sensitive design for the human race. The great root of this hour is to captivate the minds of university and college young people for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second psalm also says the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. This passage indicates a determined hostility to Jesus Christ on the part of millions in all ages. This hostility arises not only from individuals, but from the organized evil plottings of the entire human race. They combine their wicked genius and their armed might in an effort to bring the purposes of God to frustration. The base design of these enemies of God is set forth in their own confession of purpose in this psalm. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. The kings and rulers of the world will someday openly declare their purpose to be independent of God. In other words, they will declare their open rebellion and warfare against God and the human race. This is the proof of man's original departure from God in the Garden of Eden. The desire for human independence was evident at the Tower of Babel. It was manifested at the cross when they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Fallen man has always been antagonistic to the will of the sovereign God. Much of human government, culture, and even religion has been contrary to his plan for the world. Then comes the response from heaven in this psalm when it says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. God will deal in contempt with those who set their faces against him. He will rebuke their rebellion. The heavenly throne can never be threatened by creatures from this little earth. In due time, God will thunder forth in judgment. The psalmist said, Thou, O Lord, shalt laugh at them. Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. The Lord's response to organized human rebellion will include the outpouring of righteous indignation. They will try and speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. During the past few weeks, many college students have asked me, What is the cause of war? Why do men fight and hate? Jesus, knowing human nature better than any other, said regarding the future, There shall be wars and rumors of wars. This was not only prophetical, it was historical. Jesus taught that man hath always fought and always will. 
and until his nature is changed by the new birth or until Christ comes again, man will always fight, murder, plunder, and explore. During the past few years, we have been engaged in one peace conference after another at Geneva. We have been trying desperately to find a way to disarm them, but in the best efforts of men it failed. History gives little comfort that we can have permanent peace, and Christ plainly predicted that there will be wars until he returns. All the reasons for this senseless slaughter of human beings, which at this moment threatens the people of the world and causes these band of bond demonstrations all over the world. What is the end of it all? Millions ask why we cannot solve our problems which cause war. Must every generation have to fight it out? William Penn has reasoned that the external causes of war are three. To keep, to add, and to recover. I say the cause of war is far more deep-seated than the desire to defend or expand. The real cause of war is spiritual. The Bible says in James 4, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust of war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. In other words, wars stem from spiritual maladjustment. World wars are mass manifestations of the strivings and conflicts which rage in the human heart. Treaties written on paper cannot bring an end to world wars any more than a doctor's prescription written on paper can cure a man. The prescription must be applied to the affected part. In this case, the affected part are the hearts of individuals who make up our society. The Bible plainly indicates that there is something basically wrong with man himself. Nothing takes place in the world collectively which does not first take place in men individually. If the world is wrong, man was wrong first. We see here the real cause of war. It is an outward expression of man's internal conflict. Come they not hence, says James, even of your lusts that war in your members. With the exception of man, the entire universe obeys certain natural laws automatically. For two reasons, because they were never given free moral agency, and because they have never broken the moral law of God. Birds fly south in winter, not because they will to do so, but because it is their nature to do so. Birds and animals cannot sin, because the moral law does not apply to them. God gave man the moral law as a guide to moral living. The law shows man his inadequacy, and grace calls us to flee to the cross for spiritual help. The purpose of these laws and commandments is to point the way to peace. God's way is law, order, and peace. Man's way is lawlessness, disorder, and confusion. Ultimately, man will actually lead a rebellion against God. The internal conflict which goes on in the hearts of men is actually a struggle to resist the will of God. It is a battle between the self we are and the person we could be by the grace of God. Project this civil war inside the individual man to a worldwide scale, and what do you have? World war. The internal battle which is raging in your heart today away from God is a world war in embryo. That is what General MacArthur meant when he told the world that our problems are basically theological. He meant that wars are a symptom of a disease called sin. And until the individual problem of sin is met, the problem of war will remain unsolved. James said again that wars come from hatreds within. Jesus says that ye shall hear of wars and shall hate one another. Man's rebellion against man is a social expression of man's rebellion against God. Hatred, prejudice, and misunderstanding on a worldwide scale are man's expression of the spiritual resentments of the people who make up this world. They are the outcropping of the inward personal conflicts and the external manifestations of internal lust and sinful ambitions. The answer to the problems of today is found only one place, and that is at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. A month ago, we received a letter from one of our listeners to the Hour of Decision. In the letter, a story was told of an estranged husband and wife, who, although they had once loved each other, had been separated for a number of months and were awaiting the final decree of their divorce. 
will have a son who will become a Christian. The son will control his arrangement to the car company in the vicinity of their home. One day he was called out during a storm to service a transform on a high voltage line. In making the repair, he accidentally brushed his arm against the high tension line and was thrown from the high pole to the ground. He was rushed to the hospital, burned him with broken bones. His condition was critical. His parents were called to his bedside. His father stood on one side of his bed and his mother on the other side. The son took his father's right hand in his. Then taking his mother's hand in the other hand, he pulled them together over his bruised, broken, and burned body. In his last moments of life, he brought them together in reconciliation. That is a small illustration of what Jesus Christ did for the world. We were separated from God. Hatred ruled the hearts of men, and uncontrolled lusts and passions dominated their lives. Upon the cross, he atoned for man's past sins, but he did more. He provided redemption for his future sins. By the power of Christ's resurrection, man for the first time became eligible for the resurgence of divine life through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is not only a theory, it's worked in practice. Peter, who hated the Romans, loved them after he discovered this new life in Christ. Saul, who hated the Christians with a cruel hatred, after he came in contact with Christ on the Damascus Road, began to love them. By controlling the lust which caused war in the individual, Christ can meet this problem, not by scoffing at the symptoms, but by dealing with the first causes, which are the lusts which war within our members, namely sin. It is sin that causes war, and only Christ on the cross can deal with sin. There's no use in our blaming Mr. Khrushchev or the communists or in our blaming the administration for starting these nuclear tests. All of us outside of Christ are part of a world rebellion against God. All of us are in need of redemption. If you want to contribute to the possibility of world peace, then repent of your sins and make your peace with God through Jesus Christ. I receive a great many letters from people who ask, what should be the attitude of the Christian in view of the crisis in the political, moral, and spiritual realms today? My answer to all of you who put your trust in Jesus Christ is this. Don't push the panic button. Regardless of the situation on this troubled earth, God has not shifted to the edge of his throne. God is not biting his fingernails. He is not disturbed about the events which are transpiring on the earth. And there is no cause for us to be panic and panicky. We are to put our faith and our trust in him above all things. Today, whoever you are, do you have peace in your heart? Has the peace of God gripped your heart? Have you made your peace with God? If you will do so right now, then you can take a step toward the possibility of world peace. You can make your greatest contribution to society by living daily for Jesus Christ. And God's peace can be your peace today, no matter what the difficulty or trouble you may be in. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, as we look at the cause of war within our hearts and on a world scale, we see that it is sin. Help us to realize that sin can only be dealt with at the cross. Help us to come and find cleansing in the blood that flows from there. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Friday and Saturday morning in Los Angeles, a bus ran on fire collided. As the police investigated the accident, hundreds of persons gathered in beautiful lots near those who took to the concrete and the officers. Robert Houghton, the deputy police chief of Los Angeles, said, It is a rebellion against authority. We do not know what causes these things. There seems to be no crime. And I want and no one organization seems to be involved. I have just received a telegram from an outstanding judge in one of our largest eastern cities. He asked if I would be willing to talk to the leaders of teenage gangs in his city in the next few days because they expect more violence than ever from the teenagers this summer. It is true that thousands of American teenagers are in rebellion. And not only in America, but this rebellion is current in nearly every country in the world. Young people are expressing themselves in destruction all the way from stealing bobcats and flying high-speed gymnasiums to burning school fronts and demolishing cafeteria booths with their attending parties. The facts are not funny. Our wonderful Samuel Dutch in the Reader's Digest, he says this, There is a new force in evidence, a hostile and growing subculture. Wherever the local manifestations, it is marked by hostility, daring, and senseless destructiveness. Americans tell us that these young people are not the familiar, hardcore, juvenile delinquents that we read about. They come from every level of society. The wildest suburban teenager is just as destructive as the one from New York's west side. So much corruption is being uncovered among young people that one juvenile judge declared teenagers in this town know more about crime than Al Capone ever did. Fourth of Americans are asking the question, what is behind this teenage rebellion? J. Robert Austin, senior editor of Look Magazine, says, We are witnessing the death of the old morality, and no safe authority now rules our conduct. He writes, We are free to be prejudiced or promiscuous, to cheat or steal. We are not floundering in a money-motivated, sex-obsessed, big city-dominated society. We are in the midst of a moral crisis. It's bitter fruit to all around us. The beatniks, the wasteys, the wild kid, the price-making executive, the Vietnam Christian girl, the dope addict, the vandal, the brother deadly, the uncared for teenager, the poor, the criminal. Television depicts juvenile violence as the American way, and the movies are full of sodom as a warrant for four husbands and a lover, end quote. This is apparent that a large percentage of America's teenagers ignore the civil and moral authority which was respected two generations ago. The word authority has become unpopular, and yet the real problem of the teenager is rebellion. It is not so much a problem of what is right and what is wrong, but of who decides what is right and what is wrong. No longer does a teenager know who his master is. That is where I travel. I find that young people want to know, is there a final authority? Is there any objective source for this authority? When young people are left to themselves to make their own moral choices, they flounder. They are not ready for the big decisions of life. They need authority. They are insecure without it. Something inside the young person cries out in longing for someone to tell him with authority that this is right and that is wrong. All the many do not realize that youth demands authority. Many parents and teachers fail to realize that youth responds to rules and regulations and to discipline. Without this, they are lost and confused and bewildered. Furthermore, Executive Director of the Jewish Family Service of Los Angeles says, Young people need limits. They need someone in authority, and they seek that authority from their parents. But these parents have helped to create the background to their children's rebellion. Many parents imply that being popular is more important than being courteous, that being successful is more important than being honest, that being busy is more important than being together, that owning a car is more important than respecting another's property. The envy parents stay so busy with activities outside the home that a son or daughter is forced to stay just as busy himself or to be alone. Other parents are in a constant frenzy organizing activities for their children so that they won't be stuck at home with the little monsters. As a result, young people have no time to get acquainted either with their parents or with themselves. 
Please come to the exam. Would you come forward? We have both arms. So that we go up and let him say a distinct line, a distinct step of the law. But when I get out of bed, we get ready to go forward with all two bare bones. A good parent is truthful, understanding, affectionate, industrious, loyal, and stable. Every child has the right to be parents. Every child has the right to be taught about God and moral law. Our children can be no better than the homes from which they come. Secondly, our children need wise and loving discipline. Parental responsibility involves giving the child what he needs, and often he needs discipline. Following children, sparing him from correction, is one of the primary causes of delinquency. The parent who takes the time and the trouble to discipline his child loves him far more than does the angry parent who sows the seeds of delinquency in his unspanked offspring by pampering him. Recently, a teenage girl wrote a magazine article entitled, If I were a parent, I would be more strict. Children want their parents to care enough about them to be strict. The Bible teaches us to discipline our children. He that spared his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him often. Thirdly, we allow children a spiritual training. The scripture says train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart. The Bible teaches that we are to train our children line upon line, precept upon precept, little upon very little. In other words, you cannot give them religion and morality all at one time. You cannot suddenly wake up with a five-year-old boy and say, it's very late, I'm going to try to cram religion down him now. He must start at the very moment he has any understanding at all, line upon line, precept upon precept. He has to be a little here and a little there. And wherever the boy or the girl is willing to talk, the parent will drop everything and talk and answer the questions that he's asking. And allow young people get little or no religious training at home and rarely ever go to church and dare not dress like in the school? What can they expect? They have no moral criteria by which to guide their lives. They become moral monstrosities. They become spiritually and morally uneducated. Our society has reduced a generation of young people to a bored and an empty room. During these next three weeks in Phoenix, Arizona, and in San Diego, California, I intend to put a great deal of emphasis on my preaching to teenagers. I am convinced that teenagers will respond to an all-out challenge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there are thousands of teenagers rebelling against law and order. Why? Because those teenagers, many of them, are being taught that the policeman is his enemy instead of his friend. He's being taught that it's all right to lie and to break the law and even defy the law under certain circumstances. Therefore, we have lawlessness and rebellion throughout our teenage culture today. That is going to be frightening in the next generation unless we can solve it and curb it and do something about it. I believe that youth today is full of energy. And if that energy is not used in constructive ways, it will be used in harmful and dangerous ways. Being a dedicated Christian takes these sources of youthful energy and converts them to useful, constructive purposes. Christ gives meaning and direction to life. He takes young people off the wrecking crew and puts them to work on the construction gang. There is only one power available that can change the heart of a young Christian, and that is Jesus Christ. Your life can be changed in a moment if you're willing to repent and receive and to receive Christ who died for you on the cross. Will you receive him now? That is the first step you must take toward the kingdom of God and toward solving the problem of repenting in your own life. And you parents must take this step if you're to do anything about your young people before it's too late. The scripture says, For as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Will you trust and believe and accept at this moment and let Christ dominate your life? Turn all of this rebellion into Satan or Satan. Let his love dominate you. Let him come into your heart and forget all the mistakes, failures, and sins of the past and change your life and make you a new person. Shall we pray? Our Father,
Thank you, God. We pray that any gifts and all the people online will this day come to a glorious saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, who can transform and change anyone's life, who puts their trust and confidence in Him. For we ask it in His name. Amen. On June 1st, we begin the most difficult and most challenging crusade we have ever undertaken. It is the London England crusade that will be held in Earl's Court, the largest indoor arena in the British Commonwealth. Never before have we put so much planning, good intention, effort into preparation as we have in London, England. If ever we needed the prayers of Christians around the world for a crusade, it will be the London crusade. It is our hope that many of you from all over the world will come to London during the month of June and join us in this great crusade that we are praying that will make a worldwide impact. Many of the problems facing America at home and abroad are facing the British at this hour. One of these problems is the terrifying growth of immorality among young people. And it is this problem in America as well as Britain that I would like to talk about today. The Supreme Court has given a ray of hope to the growing forces in America, fighting pornography and obscenity by upholding the conviction of the lower courts of Lord Ginsburg. The Supreme Court has said, so far, but no further. In other words, there's a limit to what can be advertised and published in the name of freedom. In the March 21st issue of Newsweek magazine, there were 18 pages dealing with the revolution among teenagers today. One of the greatest revolutions taking place among teenagers is in the realm of morals. Newsweek concluded that sex is the biggest topic of conversation on any high school campus today. Students are exhibiting a low awareness about sex and calling it a sophisticated realism. There we acting violently against the attempts by parents, high school officials, or university officials to control the opportunity for sex. During the last few weeks, students have been brazenly flaunting their new freedom on the beaches at Fort Lauderdale, Daytona Beach, and Newport. They are expressing attitudes that back up what one has called an antinomian orgy of open-mindedness. In other words, the sex revolution among young people is now in full swing throughout the country. As Raymond Aaron said recently, in sexuality, America is in revolt against Christianity. The country is already paying a fantastic price for this new expressionism and freedom in the realm of sex. The number of illegitimate births has doubled in the last 10 years. An average of 20 high school girls a day drop out because of pregnancy in one of our cities that has a population of less than 1 million. In spite of modern medicines, the rural disease is now at an epidemic proportion in most sections of the country. During the past few years, obscene and pornographic literature has been allowed to corrupt the minds of our young people. All of this has been done in the name of freedom. Now the Supreme Court says there must be rules and regulations governing the type of filth that is being printed. The March 11th issue of Time magazine, under a heading entitled The Free Sex Movement, says that students at the University of California now hold nude parties. Free students, free speech, then filthy speech, now it is free love. As students test the limits of the permissible at Berkeley, California. 20 years ago, it would have been almost unthinkable for a clergyman to stand before the radio microphones and talk on such a subject. The young people learned about what was right and wrong in the realm of sex in the wrong places and in the wrong way. They were the whispered jokes, the rape innuendos, and the back alley talks. It is high time that the church begins to speak authoritatively on this subject and give young people the moral guidelines that they are desperately searching for. Dr. Sorokin, professor of sociology at Harvard University, is deeply concerned about the misuse of sex freedom in America. He said, advocates of sex freedom have been launching a revolution in our journals, films, and television with the design to destroy what has been termed old-fashioned morals. He goes on to say that this campaign has produced a harvest of forced marriages, unwed mothers, wayward husbands, fleeing wives, and a wave of other conjugal delinquency. 
excuse me, gentlemen, sex is a gift from God. But like any other God-given gift, we're inclined to bend it and warp it for our own desires. Eating is a wholesome thing, but God loves wine. Sex is a wholesome thing, but when it is not used discreetly and in the context for which God intended it, it can damage the body, the soul, the spirit, and the mind. Most of the magazines and journals quoting various sociologists, doctors, and psychiatrists indicate that sex desire is not the real cause of sex commitments. They say that it is the pressure toward conformity. Professor Hobart Moore of the University of Illinois says that such a compromise at best is a ritualized pretense of lovemaking. Many sociologists and even some clergymen are saying that premarital sex is all right if it is an act of love. But many specialists in this field doubt that it can be an act of love. Judge Jenny L. Brown of the Massachusetts Superior Court says, Almost never. The force driving a young man to break a girl down, girls must realize is not love. Rather, it is the craving for ego nature. Even the nicest young man may be selfish. In my interviews with young people, one of the questions most often asked is about cutting. There is no doubt that when two normal young people are together and alone, there is a strong physical attraction. This is not wrong. It is as it should be. But the Bible teaches restraint. Once a student asked me, but if it's normal and God ordained, why are the prohibitions? You may be hungry, but you don't break the window of the bakery to steal a loaf of bread. You buy it in the legal proper manner. You may be thirsty for a soft drink, but you don't break the machine down and steal it. You obtain it in the proper way. You may see a fur coat you just love, but that doesn't give you a license to own it before you pay for it. The Bible teaches that sex was made to be used in the confines of marriage. Not only is God's law broken, but there is ample psychological evidence that premature and premarital sex inflicts deep psychic scars that you may carry all your life. It is not only in the interest of health, but of happiness that the Bible teaches that immorality is a sin. This depersonalized, meaningless, and degrading pattern of courtship, as one educator has called it, can color and devastate your chance for happiness the rest of your life. Love is a basic need of all persons, but love and sex are two different things, though they certainly have a relationship to each other. Marriages based on sex are in danger from the beginning. Marriage counselors all agree that sex is only one of many ingredients in a happy marriage. If love were purely physical, it would terminate when physical duty began to wane. That is why a happy marriage should not be based on animal attraction only. We will not always be physically attractive, but attractive or not, the need for love, both giving and receiving it, will be with us as long as we live. If young people could learn to distinguish between real love and mere sex feelings, they would have learned one of the most valuable lessons of life. Sex is selfish. Real love is unselfish. Sex is for the moment. Genuine love is for keeps. Sex is physical. Genuine love is spiritual. The Bible says, Now abide in faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Sex, apart from responsible love within the bounds of matrimony, creates guilt feelings. Genuine love gives you a sense of serenity and well-being. Anyone can participate in sex, even animals. But love is the highest of human experiences. The first chapter in the Bible concludes with the words, And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. Among other things, this referred to the natural attraction between the sexes. It was and is intended to be a beautiful and sacred gift within the ethic of true love and in the bond of matrimony. But like other God-given attributes, it can be cheapened and made an ugly, sordid, repulsive thing. Whether you like it or not, you were born in a sex-conscious era. Sex appeal has become a must in commercial advertising. Sex in its natural and perverted forms comprises the subject matter for many of our films, books, plays, and television. It will come to you in many forms and in many disguises. Being a normal person, your natural instincts will respond to many of these stimuli. Learn to distinguish between that which is wholesome and that which is sordid. 
the Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy, Free in youth the lust. Not as a man that thinks and collects any cooperative coil, but as usually wants to marry a girl with character and ideals. One of the best ways to get a boy to say I do at the marriage altar is for the girl to say no before the marriage. There are at least four reasons why God has said thou shalt not commit immorality. First, it is to protect your future marriage. If you commit immorality before marriage, it affects your marriage later. Secondly, to protect your body. A few days ago on the Today Show, Hugh Downs interviewed a specialist in venereal diseases. He says that there are 1,500 new cases of venereal diseases every day in the United States. Venereal disease has tripled in the last 10 years. Illegitimacy has doubled in the last 10 years. It is now estimated that more than a million women a year attempt an abortion. I seriously doubt if the average boy or girl can quite realize the devastating effects that immorality can have on the body. Many say that they won't get caught, but the fact is that tens of thousands are caught. Thirdly, God said, Thou shalt not commit immorality to protect you psychologically. A Radcliffe student admitted to one of the magazine reporters a few weeks ago that she always feels guilty about committing immorality. Many have guilt complexes, emotional disturbances. They often feel insecure and unloved. Fourthly, God said, Thou shalt not commit immorality in order to secure the foundations of society. The water problem can threaten the very security of any nation. I am convinced that Satan has a master plan to destroy America, Britain, Australia, Canada, and the other nations of the world. His greatest plan is to get us so rotten at the core that we will collapse from the inside. Unless the moral trend can be reversed in this country, we are doomed as a cohesive society. Thus, it was for our own good that God said, Thou shalt not commit immorality. No one can read the Bible without being convinced that immorality is one of the most grievous sins that we can commit before God. The Bible says, The works of the flesh are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. The Bible says that the sin of immorality is the result of the deceitfulness of sin. The Bible teaches that those who are guilty of the sin of impurity shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Think of it. A person who is guilty of this sin cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, you are going to have to stand at the judgment bar of God with this terrible sin and give an account. Many ask, what is the remedy? What can we do? Is there any hope? Yes, I'm glad to announce that there is hope. There is hope for you who are held in the grip of immorality. Mary Magdalene, the woman at Jacob's well, and the woman taken in adultery could all have seen the medicine. There was a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood and lose all their guilty stains. When the adulteress was brought to Jesus by the Pharisees, they demanded that she be stoned and destroyed. Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, Whatever he wrote convicted them of their own sins and made them leave one by one. And Jesus stood alone with the woman and said, Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No, my Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. This impure woman is the symbol of all those who are held in the grip of impurity. She had sinned, but she had found forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Christ can do only one thing with sin. He does not condone it. He does not condemn it. He forgives it when it is repented of. The Bible says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. When Christ died on that cross, he died for the sins of immorality as for other sins. Today, if you are willing to give your life to Jesus Christ, God will forgive all the past, but he does far more than that. He said to the woman, Go and sin no more. There are many of you who say, I've tried a thousand times, but it has an unbreakable grip on me. Yes, but Jesus gave hope to this woman that it could give victory over future sins. He never told anyone to do something before he gave him the power to do it. In other words, there is hope as you face the temptations of tomorrow that there will be a supernatural power, a 
Some of them will help you to gain the victory over one of the most blatant and damaging sins a young person can commit. I pray today that you will receive Christ. Let him give you supernatural power to face the temptations of today and tomorrow and the days ahead. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that young and old alike across America will sense the seriousness of this sin, repent of the sin, and receive the gift of forgiveness that emanates from the cross where he died for all sin. For we ask it in his name. Amen. I went to the tailor and once said, I have the body of a woman and the emotions of a child. I announced not that she was breaking her marriage to Eddie Fisher in order to marry a fit husband, only by the time she was 30, bears out her own self-analysis. A newspaper columnist said this past week that emotions were running so high in Algeria over the indiscriminate killing on both sides that it will take a hundred years to subdue these feelings. It is impossible for us to understand the deep feelings involved in the tragedy of Algeria as President de Gaulle tries heroically to bring about peace. Perhaps at no time in history have the emotions of men been so fanned on a worldwide scale as today. A psychiatrist recently said, we're thinking with our emotions rather than our heads. Another said, this generation has been schooled in violence, sex, and mischief, and because they've been deprived of wholesome outlets for their youthful emotions, they've been led into lawlessness, immorality, and godlessness. Emotion seems to be in vogue in every phase of our life, except in our experience of Christian faith. The movie stars who mowed on our giant screens as ladies in the audience sob and restrain gentlemen unashamedly wipe a tear from their eyes. Television stars use all of their powers to move the viewers, employing highly emotional sights and sounds to evoke feelings of sympathy, contempt and passion in the hearts and minds of the audience. Our writers use every device at their command to lead their readers into emotion-packed conditions and create situations to stir the hearts of those who buy their wares. Politicians leave no stone unturned in playing upon the emotions of their constituents, in impassioned efforts to get votes for their campaigns. And even in our sports, the atmosphere in the stadium and ballpark is one of enthusiasm and super emotion. Who can imagine a football game or a baseball game in which there was no cheering or shouting at the umpire? However, in the most sensitive, vital areas of our lives, in our spiritual experiences, we are warned by many religious leaders that emotion has no place. When we started our evangelistic work 12 years ago, evangelism was considered too emotional. Therefore, I leaned over backwards in our crusades to have little or no emotion. There are no emotional outbursts of any kind in our meetings. Thus, I am far from being an advocate of cheap, shallow, contrived emotionalism in Christianity. However, I believe that the church has inadvertently choked itself on dignity, decorum, and self-styled decency as the world has turned to its own devices for the emotional outlet that it claims by nature. Why is it that we are encouraged to feel deeply about sports, politics, entertainment, literature, art, and music, and not about religion? Why is it that when we choose a nominee for president, every strain on human emotion is played, and yet when a man makes the greatest choice in life of choosing Christ as his Savior, he is warned not to have emotion? While I have never subscribed to sensationalism, surface emotionalism, or fleshly religious demonstrations, I believe there is a need today for a return to heartfelt faith in Jesus Christ. I never told deathbed stories or emotional illustrations to work on the emotions of people. However, I believe that there is a sorrow that worketh to repentance and that men still need to be moved toward God. The word emotion comes from the Latin word mover, which means to move. It also carries the meaning of strong, deep feelings about any object, group, or person. John Wesley said that the main task of the Church of England before the Wesleyan revival had been, everything must be done decently and in order. But while the deteriorating Anglican Church was going through the meaningless, fruitless notions of decency and order, John Wesley, with a warm heart, was remaking a nation by saving the indecent and doing what God had ordered. His warm heart, his urging people to feel deeply about their faith in God, transformed the nation 
that have been claimed by dignity. Many people express the view that any display of emotion or show of feeling is a sign of weakness of character and is to be abandoned at all costs. To weep in public, for example, would be considered almost despicable according to this view. By custom and education, we shrink from an over-display of emotion in ourselves or in others. And rightly so, if there's an evidence or lack of control. We are not surprised to see outbursts of anger or weeping in a small child, but we do not expect to see such exhibitions in an adult, especially in public. However, there is no doubt that Jesus showed a variety of emotions. Among these emotions were anger, sorrow, grief, and joy. On two occasions, he wept openly and publicly. One, when he stood by the graveside of Lazarus. Another, when he contemplated Jerusalem's fate in its rejection of him. Our Lord displayed an extremity of grief and anguish of soul in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yet it is impossible to think of him as one who allowed his emotion or life to get out of control. He never allowed danger to drive him into fear or panic, and on no occasion did he display anger or hasty words. A perfect underlying calmness and balance characterized Christ. He never displayed the indifference of stoicism on the one hand, or the weakness of uncontrolled emotion on the other. He showed love and sympathy without sentimentality, and anger without loss of temper. In his words and in his actions, he showed the poise and self-command of a perfectly balanced personality. Dr. Ernest White, a London psychiatrist, says, emotions play a large and important part in normal mental function. They give tone and color to existence. Emotions give a stimulus to action. A man who feels strongly has an urge to do something about it. Emotions are the springboard of action. They lie at the base of much of our behavior and determine many of life's most important decisions. Two of these most important decisions of life are connected with marriage and a career. What sort of a marriage would probably result if the man chose the girl on a purely intellectual basis without any emotional factors entering into his choice? When we use the expression falling in love, that implies a strong emotional experience. Similarly, in choosing a career, psychology has found that although on the surface it may seem as though reason is the determining factor in most cases, deeper analysis shows that instinctive and emotional causes lie behind the choice. Moses must have had deep, moving feeling at the burning bush when he consecrated himself to the task of delivering a nation from Egypt's bondage. It must have been a moving experience to Isaiah when he saw the Lord cry and lifted up and fell on his face and cried, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. David must have been deeply moved after he had sought and found forgiveness from the Lord as he sang, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Peter, James, and John must have been stirred to the very depths of their souls when they stood with Jesus on the night of transfiguration and saw Christ in all of his glory talking to Elijah and Moses. Peter must have been deeply moved when he asked the Lord if he could stay stay there and build three tabernacles. Certainly the blind man must have been deeply stirred when he opened his eyes for the first time and with perfect vision looked into the face of Jesus. The Bible says that he went his way rejoicing, leaping and shouting and praising God. Mary Magdalene would probably be considered emotionally unstable by many today because she came and broke a box of ointment and washed the feet of Jesus with her hair and tears. What a moving experience it must have been when Mary, Mary Magdalene, Magdalene and Shalom stood at the empty tomb and heard the angels say, He is not here, he is risen. How deeply the two must have been moved on the road to Emmaus when Jesus opened the scriptures to them. In talking about it later, they said, Did not our hearts burn within us? Where is the burning heart of people today? Where are the deep feelings of people about others today? Where are these feelings that will drive us into the highways, byways, and out into the streets to preach and testify concerning Jesus Christ. Certainly Saul of Tarsus must have been moved when he was stricken under the knife and killed. And hearing the voice of the Lord, he cried, What wilt thou have me to do? We cannot like Christianity off as a cold, calculating, cruel code that leaves no impact upon the emotional nature of man. Christ touches our emotions, and our whole being throbs with the spiritual attributes of joy, love, peace, gentleness, meekness, and faith. 
the new plaque in the middle of the saga. I am human emotion. Tears flow. Human joy is when we cry. Glad when we stretch it. Glad when I preach them well. And praise spills from every page. Conversion is often preceded by emotional conflict in varying degrees of length and intensity. Conviction of sin and realization of the root of Savior may have an intellectual content and on the teaching of Scripture, but they also have an emotional content. Conversion is rarely, if ever, as a result of clear intellectual reasoning. It is brought about by a feeling of regret and guilt for the failure, sins, and shortcomings of the past, and by a desire to find a solution to the emotional problem rending the soul. Many people condemn the evangelists for preaching on the holiness, justice, and judgment of God. They say this is appealing to fear. In the dramatic story of the conversion of the Philippian jailer, the Bible says the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and threw himself down before Paul and Silas, trembling with fear because of the earthquake. This man had the emotion of fear dominating him at that moment. Many people would say that he was in no emotional state to be converted. Paul did not look at it that way. The man then and there received Christ as Savior, and the scripture says that Paul immediately baptized him. The scripture says that he had another emotion. The scripture says that he rejoiced with his whole household and his newfound faith in God. In other words, fear was the dominating emotion that brought him to Christ, and as soon as he came to Christ, it was supplanted by the emotion of joy and rejoicing. The emotions displayed at the time of conversion varied greatly according to the temperament, previous history, and circumstances of the convert. The Bible also teaches that the intellect and the will are deeply involved in conversion. The New Testament lays stress on the will, and its last appeal is to the will of man. This is what we will. Let him take of the water of life freely, says Revelation 22, 17. We are to know the truth revealed in the gospel message as well as to exercise our wills and experience emotion. There are many spurious conversions which are the result of an emotional crisis only. I recognize that. They are like the seeds sown on stony ground which spring up and quickly wither away because they have no root. Oftentimes, however, we think that because there has been much open emotion in certain types of revivalisms of the past that we should have no emotion and feeling in our faith at all. The faith by which we are saved is something far more than intellectual acceptance of doctrines and historic facts. It involves will and emotion as well. There is a far difference between true, lifeless belief and a living faith. For a Christian faith includes an emotional response to a living Christ and a personal relationship to Him. Faith is confidence, trust in a person. It is possible to possess correct doctrine, to have an intellectual knowledge of the Bible, and yet to lack the power to live the Christian life. Emotions are the driving power behind conduct, and knowledge by itself may leave a man's character untouched. Paul said that knowledge puffeth up, but love buildeth up. As believers in Christ, we should seek the middle path between a stoical, unemotional life on the one hand and a gushing emotional display on the other. We should be ready always to weep with those that weep and to rejoice with those that rejoice. We should, when necessary, be moved with compassion, just as our Lord was when he saw the multitude scattered abroad as sheep without a shepherd. Sympathy demands emotion. It's very moving. Feel the word. Empathize with it. But we should never allow our emotions to gain control or to get out of control. Emotions are like a fire in the furnace. When contained, there under control, the fire provides warmth for the entire house. But if it escapes from the control of the furnace, the fire's warmth quickly changes to burning and destruction. Our emotions must be under the control of the Holy Spirit, else we are in danger. Has your life been ruled by the lower passions and by sinful emotions? Has your emotional life been crushed and mutilated by the works of the flesh, such as adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, hatred, wrath, strife, drunkenness, and reverence? Christ has promised sudden victory over these forces of your nature, which have pervaded your emotions and made your moral struggle a spiritual stalemate. The Bible says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. For your hatred he will give you love. 
that will respond and will give me peace, that will bless and he will give me joy. Christ is not our weak side, we shall make sure. He transcends it. He transcends it along with our hills and our regions and fashions us into the image of himself, making us to live triumphantly in the world with an inward peace that is beyond human comprehension and understanding. To you Christians that are listening in today, I am asking that your faith become, as the old lady used to say, it's better felt than taught. I'm asking you today to have some feeling in your faith. I'm asking that you have so much feeling in your faith that you will start your Bible reading, prayer, faithful church attendance, witnessing for Christ, tithing to the work of the Lord. I'm asking you today to let your faith in Christ win of you to a complete surrender and dedication of life and purpose to Him. When Christ comes into the heart, He touches the entire man, the intellect, the emotion, and the will. He demands the surrender and consecration of our our bodies as living sacrifices unto him. Would you receive him today into your heart and let him touch the entire man? Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that thou wouldst touch our emotions, our intellect, and our will. And may we be totally yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. For we ask it in his name. Amen.
Everything related to you make me smile I know you are doing hard work to make things possible I want to let you know that I am with you And I will be forever Every little thing related to you make me smile I know you are doing hard work to make things possible Related to you make me smile I know you are doing hard work to make things possible I want to let you know that I am with you And I will be forever